Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, my name is Matthew Trowbridge, and um, I am a, a physician and an associate professor at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. I'm trained clinically in pediatrics and preventive medicine, but for the last five years, the majority of my collaborators have been architects, urban planners, green health advocates, and next week I'm traveling to New York City to present to a room full of commercial real estate investors. Yeah, it's a reasonable question to ask, why is a doctor spending so much time thinking about the design of buildings, city planning, and real estate investment? And I think over the next few minutes, I'd like to give you three reasons why I believe strongly that the built environment is an important and increasingly urgent opportunity for us to prevent chronic disease, prevent injuries, address systematic social injustices, and along the way, increase our quality of life on a daily basis. So here are the facts. The health and place are linked. In fact, knowing where somebody lives provides much uh, better predictive uh, accuracy about how uh, life expectancy of someone than information about their genetic code. Some amazing researchers at Vir uh, Virginia Commonwealth University have mapped average life expectancies for cities across the country by zip code. <clears throat> and the results are quite frankly startling. Uh, just looking at, at New York City, if you are someone who lives in the Upper West Side near Lincoln Center, uh, your, your expected life expectancy is 84 years. If you travel by train just a few stops north up into Harlem, that drops eight years. Um, you know, this is, it's, it's a difficult but true thing, and these, and these, these results are, are standard and predictable across the United States. So what's going on? <clears throat> well, in reality, what turns out when you look at the data uh, the variance in healthcare delivery quality and access really only accounts for about 20% of health outcomes. What accounts for everything else is what we call the social and environmental determinants of health. And where you live is a huge part of that. You know, whether you have access to fresh food uh, in grocery stores near you, <clears throat> whether you have a place to walk that's safe, both in terms of whether you have adequate sidewalks, uh, bike paths, but also whether it's just you feel safe in terms of interpersonal violence. These things make a huge difference. And the reality is this isn't a secret. <laughs> um, pretty much every single uh, major public health institution knows and is starting to prioritize the built environment as an, inc as an integral part of what it means to deliver health care. You know, just take, for example, uh, the immediate past president of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Dr. Lavizzo Mori, who says it right here, health is inextricably tied to where we live, work, and play. It's also not new, okay? So the idea that uh, environmental toxins are an important part of, uh, of health care is not new. I mean, in general pediatrics, the idea of thinking about and looking out for lead exposure among your patients, that's, that's a very old and very well-established practice. But here's the difference. What we're starting to realize is that we're starting to see that the way we have designed our cities, our transportation systems, constitutes essentially a new type of environmental toxin. We are making places that force us to be automobile reliant. That means less physical activity. That means more traffic injuries. That means a lot less social connectedness. And we're just kind of coming to grips with that right now. We're also seeing that the way we've built our cities makes us very vulnerable to acute events, uh, as all of us have seen this, this year uh, through the hurricanes in, in Houston and Miami. And these types of events are more likely to occur in an era of climate change. The good news, okay, is that we really are learning something about how to integrate consideration of health and well-being into real estate development. And we're starting to see real projects built across the United States that not only uh, uh, show these types of uh, healthy features, but also represent process that is formally integrating health as a consideration. Take, for example, 
you know, Drew Senior Academy in Eastlake, Atlanta. So you know, Eastlake uh, is the product of a visionary uh, real estate developer working very closely with uh, community members in, in Atlanta. And basically, uh, the project they did was entirely focused on improving the lives of the neighborhood, of the neighborhood inhabitants. And basically, there, this development includes uh, mixed income housing, it includes um, a, a new school with extremely high academic standards, and even a new YMCA. And the results have been really remarkable. And the, some of the Drew Senior Academy has some of the highest uh, achievement scores in the, in the city of Atlanta and have seen precipitous uh, decreases in, uh, in violence. And this is in an area of Atlanta that as recently as the early 90s had some of the highest uh, violence rates, not only in the city, but actually in the US. Or the Mariposa development in Denver. So this is a project between the Denver Housing Authority and Methune Design. And they formally incorporated health impact assessment, which is a very established way of considering health impacts of decisions into the development of this project. And the result is amazing. Based on community engagement and this process, they identified prioritization of community gardens, bike shares, and worked with the city of Denver to make a light rail stop right in the, the development project itself. The really cool thing is I've actually had personal experience of being able to participate in one of these health-focused design projects as well. I'm talking about uh, Buckingham Elementary School in Dillwyn, Virginia, which I collaborated on uh, with VMDO Architects. And the purpose of, so, of talking about this story is not to show beautiful uh, architectural images of a, of a building, although the school is quite beautiful. Now, I, what I'm telling you the story is, this is actually a story of a truly visionary superintendent who lives in a rural, very low income, ethnically diverse county in central Virginia, who basically asked the question, how might we use this $50 million that my community gets only about every 30 years to address the rise of childhood obesity in our community? And the result was a pretty phenomenal uh, collaboration. Clicker is not, there we go. The result was an amazing collaboration between VMDO Architects and, my, and a research team that I, uh, I was part of at University of Virginia. And essentially the goal that we did was we took as much, all uh, decades of evidence on school-based obesity prevention programming and worked with VMDO to translate it into actionable design guidelines for school architecture. To, think about how do we use a school to promote physical activity and how do we use the school building itself to also promote healthy eating. The really cool thing is when you walk through this school, which has been built, uh, you're struck with, the, the as we intended, the health messaging is broadcast loud and clear. There are these beautiful active stairs in the entrance to the, to the school building which celebrate physical activity. Details, like even the furniture choices that were made throughout the school, all are focused on promoting physical activity. Even when children are just sitting at their desks doing their work, they're allowed to keep, these stools have a round bottom that allowed, allow them to fidget and move. And it's been shown not just to improve um, academic performance, but also to allow them to get uh, reduced sedentary time as well. And overall, what it creates is this really beautiful and purposeful culture of movement throughout the school, which is incredibly successful, and we're very proud of this experience. And the key thing, though, is, uh, you know, it's also a good news that what do we do with all this information? Well, there's something I need you guys to do with me here, okay? Because the reality is that as cool as these projects are as individual examples, they really won't make a difference by themselves. Our vision for changing the built environment to improve health, it really can't be about tens of projects or even hundreds. We really need thousands. And when you talk about changing thousands of projects, now you're talking about fundamentally changing the way we do real estate development in the country and in the world. We need health promotion to be as standard a consideration in real estate development as, for example, green or sustainability has come to be. And that's why I like to quote my, my longtime men, uh, research colleague, Chris Pike, with this beautiful quote of, we need to move beyond random acts of health promotion in the built environment to really achieve this. So what's my call of action for you guys? If you're an individual in your own community, 
pay attention. When you see a built environment project coming up, attend the city council meeting. Be there as a person from MedEx to talk about and promote. Stand up for health, stand up for equity um, in these projects. You will make a difference. If you're a healthcare administrator or another corporate uh, uh, you know, leader, think about how you can make, use the investments you're making in your real estate to do more than just create a cool building. Think about how it can be an extension of your mission. I, I guarantee you'll, you'll, you'll re reap lots of rewards. So basically, I need your help, and I'm really excited to do this together, and I know we can do it. Thanks very much.